Good evening, my name is Sandra Valtero and this is Be Prepared. Be Prepared is a show on health, wellness, and safety. And tonight we're talking about emergency preparedness for people with disabilities. And with me tonight I have two guests. One is called Daylon Peterson, P Pearson, sorry. And uh, he is an emergency training coordinator for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and also for the Massachusetts Office of Disability. As an emergency preparedness trainer and local emergency planner, Daylon conducts trainings throughout Massachusetts between people with disabilities and local emergency personnel to explore how to ensure that people with disabilities have the assistance they need in times of emergency. Very important job, Daylon. Thank you. And next to us is Susan Ward Wolf for Ham JD, who is an instructor at the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health and the Director of the Emergency Preparedness Initiatives at the University of Massachusetts Medical School's Eunice Kennedy Shriver Center. She is a several, she's on several national and state advisory committees. She's also the co-founder of the Special Needs Education Resource Center in Ukraine. She holds a BA in American Studies with Smith College and is a graduate of Boston University School of Law. She was a federally funded LEN graduate fellow at, at the MPA and is an MPA candidate at Suffolk University. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Well, tonight uh, we were supposed to have another guest from MEMA, but unfortunately she wasn't able to be with us, so I did uh, have an interview with her. So let's take a look at that uh, interview, if we can. Tonight, uh, Sarah, Z from MEMA wasn't able to uh, stay and be on our show, but she took some time to uh, be interviewed by me. So, uh, Sarah, you're with MEMA, and could you explain to the public what MEMA is about and uh, what actually you do for them? Sure. So, um, MEMA is the state agency that is um, charged with ensuring that the state can withstand and respond to and recover from all emergencies and disasters. Uh, I work as an all hazards planner with MEMA. So day to day operations involves me working in the planning department. And um, basically we develop and maintain the state's comprehensive emergency management plan and all of its functional annexes and, and hazard uh, related annexes. Um, so that's what we do day to day. And then of course, um, if there's a disaster or emergency, our state emergency operations center is based out of our headquarters in Framingham. And um, I work in the planning section uh, should we have to stand up. And so how does the MEMA help uh, local uh, disaster preparedness uh, situations? So um, in relation to um, ensuring that the needs of all populations are being met, one of the things that we do at MEMA is we offer uh, training support and guidance. So we have a training right now that we've developed um, that is targeted towards our local emergency management directors and also uh, local level planners. And that training is really a training with respect to planning guidance on how um, at the local level um, folks can be better prepared to plan for the whole community. So it incorporates um, basically a discussion on uh, access and functional needs and disabilities. What are the legal considerations? So making sure that um, emergency management directors know their legal roles and responsibilities under uh, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We talk about uh, the importance of inclusive planning. And then we also get into the core emergency management functions, so sheltering and evacuation and public information, and making sure that we're providing guidance and tips and uh, tools and resources for our local planners um, with respect, again, to making sure that they're taking uh, all populations into consideration when they're planning. Well, that's very good. Yeah. We need to be particularly concerned, I think, in uh, small towns who don't have really shelters set up yet and so forth. There's particular needs for the people with disabilities. Absolutely. So yeah. I think there's great value to this training mm -hmm. um, to, again, give, give folks the guidance that they need to, to improve um, those areas of planning. And do you have a special committee that looks into all these uh, situations? We do. So um, I'm privileged to be the, the chair um, for MEMA's Access and Functional Needs Advisory Committee. And we're a committee uh, comprised of private, local, state, and federal agencies and organizations mm -hmm. that are either involved in emergency management 
or um, service support and advocate for people with disabilities. So we're a wonderful group of folks um, who really give uh, MEMA some guidance on uh, making sure, one, that those considerations are built into state plans um, and how to improve those plans, again, so that we're meeting the needs of the whole community. Um, but they're also a great sounding board in terms of information sharing, um, assisting with any community projects or outreach. Um, so just a, a wonderful, wonderful group. And um, I guess the most important piece of that group is the, the relationships that we've established with one another. Um, so we have these strong relationships um, with our partners and, and that's important because we're not in a situation where we're gonna have to meet for the first time in an emergency. We, we, you know, we've already got this strong bond mm -hmm. um, and working relationship. So um, a great committee, uh, does wonderful work and, and again, so privileged to be part of it. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's a lot of good information. I'm, I'm sure that this group is gonna be very helpful for us here in our own communities. Absolutely. You know, to help uh, people, especially with special needs. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for being here. And I know you've had 15 years of human service work, so that's really good because you can understand the particular needs that we have to uh, be prepared for. Absolutely. You know. It's certainly helpful. Yeah, so thank you for coming in. Well, thank you for having me. It. So it was very nice to have her visit and tell us a little bit more about MEMA. And so that brings us to, uh, I'd like to find out, first of all, from you, Daylon. Uh, tell me about uh, the Massachusetts Office of Disability and what you do there. Yes, so we're a small state agency, but we service the entire Commonwealth. We provide uh, assistance, client service program. Uh, we also do community uh, monitoring for different buildings. We sit on an architectural access board. Mm -hmm. uh, we provide various amounts of training, emergency preparedness, uh, ADA laws, uh, and we also uh, make sure that well, we have someone Sorry. We also have someone uh, who would do a CAM training, which is community access and monitoring to help make sure that buildings are accessible. Mm -hmm. My role directly, I'm an emergency preparedness training coordinator. So it is my job to go out to various locations throughout uh, the state of Mass. And I work with the community members, both the people with disabilities and local uh, first responders so that we can help ensure people have a plan in during times of emergencies. Mm. Very important job. Very yes. important. Yeah, definitely. Susan, maybe you could tell us about, um, you have so many jobs here. <laughs> tell us about the, as the director of the Emergency Preparedness Initiative, well, what does that entail and what do you do? Sure, so um, I work at the E.K. Shriver Center at UMass Medical School. Mm -hmm. And the Shriver Center is a research center focusing on enhancing the quality of life for people with developmental disabilities, autism and other disabilities. Mm -hmm. My main role there is as head of the Emergency Preparedness Initiative mm -hmm. and our group does work related to research, training and community service around inclusive emergency preparedness. Mm. Wow, very important jobs. Well, let's start off. Delon, um, how do adults with disabilities prepare themselves? So I think the first thing that needs to be considered is what is the disability and making sure that your plan is accessible and it makes sense for you when you are planning. Mm -hmm. um, but what we encourage people to do is to really get involved in their community and get to know their first responders. Uh, so we run an emergency preparedness training program that kind of bridges that gap mm -hmm. and has both consumers with the locals and emergency responders so that you know if there's questions you know oftentimes during these trainings I find that people with disability feel as if they are left out in the planning process mm -hmm. uh, so the first responders get to communicate with them and let them know you know what plans they have and then the uh, first responders also provide that information and people typically you know figure out if the plan works for them so it's really having that face-to-face -face conversation yeah. and then once you figure out figure it out it's you know what can I do to prepare for myself you know what's going to work for me mm, yeah so you do that to for adults yes specifically yeah well it, it's certainly it's for all people with disabilities but for the most common uh, I've been contacted typically 
by adults. Okay. Is there a different kind of preparedness for people, uh, for children, that to be prepared? So um, I would second everything Daylon has said. Mm -hmm. We also have um, a training program for adults, particularly for adults with developmental and um, intellectual disabilities and physical disabilities. We also train responders, um, but one program I'm particularly proud about is our training for parents of children with special needs and uh, with uh, chronic health conditions and disabilities. And when I speak to parents, what I say is there is a small amount of stuff you should get, but often people don't have the resources, mm -hmm. the financial resources for that. So even more important is what I call what if thinking and planning. What if I, my child uses a power wheelchair? What if we don't have power? Mm -hmm. What's my plan? Mm -hmm. Do I have a backup manual wheelchair? Do I maybe have a second battery? Do I have another place I can charge it? Mm -hmm. That kind of what if thinking and planning um, specifically for their child. The other thing I recommend is thinking about sharing what I call need to know information. Mm -hmm. So a neighbor is coming to help, a responder is at the door, how do I quickly explain my child's needs without using jargon? Mm -hmm. And how do I quickly talk about functional needs? I'm at a shelter with my child. I need to give more extensive information. What's the best way to do that? And during our trainings, we share a template that we've developed so that parents can complete an emergency plan for their child. Okay, so, and that is also for not for going into sheltering, but for also sheltering in place. Yes, Do you have yes, a it's all hazards, um, yeah. and I'm sure you too yes, also work on well, all yes. hazards preparedness. Right, right. okay. So um, I guess most people want to know is how do they create a plan to begin with? Where do they start? What's important to know? Well, I, I think what's important to know is your community, right? Yes. There's different communities that have, you know, there's different communities and some communities are prone to other emergencies than some throughout the Commonwealth. Mm. So know your area, right? And also know your zones. And you know, again, by building that face-to-face -face relationship, you get to talk to the first responders. So now you know what you should do. Mm. And again, creating your plan is so important on, for families mm. overall that it really helps you during that time of emergency, right? So one of the things that we do, we have a supplemental packet and we also give personal workbooks that you can write down your contact information, um, any health information. It also, you can also list down evacuation routes and any medication that you may be using. Mm -hmm. um, but it's having that hard copy, that hard document, because mm. let's admit it, during a time of emergency, you know, we start to panic, we start to forget things. But by, mm. by having an actual copy, you know, you go open it up and say, this is what I need to do. And it's almost step by step. So to keep your important records in it, too? Yes. You know? Very important. I mean, like, what do they actually, do you think they need to take with them, like birth certificates or what would you suggest that they include so, in that? Um, we, we actually recommend they do this what if thinking and planning and get ready to write some of that down. Mm -hmm. Think about sharing that need to know information and write some of that down. We have a template for that. I think for everybody, whether you're a parent of a child with a disability or not, it's mm -hmm. helpful to have cash with you. Mm -hmm. um, it's helpful for parents of children with disabilities to have a copy of the IEP, the Individualized Education Program, um, in addition to whatever else you're gonna have for your family, uh, medications and a list of medications as well as vendors for uh, the, a list of vendors for assistive technology and adaptive equipment. For many of the parents that I've trained, it's really important for them to put down on paper the functional needs of their children. So I'll take my own daughter's example. I'm the mom of a adult daughter with a severe disability on the first page of my plan, I don't put her diagnosis because that won't mean anything right. to anybody because it's rare. I talk about her communication needs. Of course, I give name, address, date of birth, insurance information, right. but communication needs, behavioral issues, what she might need help with if I wasn't there and my husband wasn't there or we were somehow 
hurt and unable mm -hmm. to provide that help. Just like um, Daylon's plan, we have, uh, we call it the connections page, where people are writing down key contact mm -hmm. information. There's a page where they can make a note of the comfort items mm -hmm. their child might like. So say someone has a child with autism and that child um, holds on to a small object that makes them feel secure. Mm -hmm. So you want to bring that small yes. object right with you to the shelter. Absolutely. Um, like you, we also have pages in the back that list more about the medications in detail. Um, but that first page for us is really almost the elevator story plus some additional information so that the parents don't even have to remember anything. They can just hand the piece of paper to um, the responder or to somebody at the shelter. Okay, where do they get this plan? On the internet? So if they go to shriver.umassmed.edu, this is a hard copy of what we have. Mm -hmm. um, it's a resource notebook. It's also um, an accessible emergency plan template, mm -hmm. and they're welcome to download it. Okay, good. And we also have two supplemental packets as well, and they can go uh, to mass.gov and MOD. Um, and one is their own booklet to create their own personal preparedness plan. And this one is going to be a, a packet full of state resources, a various amounts of state resources that can be helpful uh, before, during, or after an emergency. Very helpful. Very helpful. Okay. Uh, so tell us about some of the resources that are available for people to get some knowledge besides what you've told me here. Are there others? You I'll, want to take that? Do you want me to oh, yes. go oh, first? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have additional resources on our website for um, communities to do inclusive emergency planning. We have resources for parents, as I've mentioned, resources for adults with um, disabilities. Ready.gov is a national website yes. that also has resources. Very helpful. His website has, Daylon's website has great resources mm -hmm. as well. Um, Excellent. I think the issue is there are so many resources out there you can sometimes get overwhelmed with yes, information. Right. Mm -hmm. So basically maybe start off with just one or two and not overwhelm yourself. So yeah. would you explain to people what does it mean to shelter in place? Yeah, so shelter in place means uh, for you to literally Find somewhere in your location that is secure mm -hmm. for you and your family, right? It's going to vary depending on the emergency and the type of situation. But, you, you know, if you are, if you're in a, uh, typically if you are uh, during, excuse me, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. That's right. uh, typically, you want to go somewhere with it's a strong structural, you know, a strong building. And you literally just want to make sure that you have all your ne necessity needs, water, food, you know, the power most likely is going to go out but you have everybody safe, and that's typically what shelter in place means. Mm -hmm. Do not leave that area. That area should be a secure location. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think people are worried too with disabilities. How do they get notified that something's wrong, that there's some kind of disaster going on? Mm -hmm. Is there some way they can be notified? Yeah, so it's gonna vary uh, throughout the state, You know, depending on what town or city you are in. Mm -hmm. Most towns will have a system, a code red system, or reverse 911 system, mm -hmm. um, and it's typically an automated, or you may get a live call, but they will inform you of the information going on, and, you know, this is what's going on, in this, uh, this is what's going on in this community, this is the emergency, mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do, this is what we are asking for you to do. That's good. And so in my research, I found towns that share information in a lot of different ways, and we recommend to the people we train, call your town and find out how they want you to communicate mm -hmm. with them because mm -hmm. it might not be 911 right. and how they will be communicating with you. So some towns put information on the website. Some towns um, send information out by social media. There's mm -hmm. a town I work with that has an in-town radio station. Um, it could be a combination of things. Right, exactly. Okay, uh, tell me a little bit about the Americans with Disability Act. So the Americans with Disabilities Act is a federal civil rights law that protects people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. It applies in emergencies and disasters. It applies 
to um, responders. It applies to states and mm -hmm. communities. And the, the short version is it provides for equal access and opportunity in emergency services as it does in many other areas. Good. So tell me uh, one other question. How can community health centers and doctor's offices increase their own preparedness ahead of time? So we have, um, a, we've just finished a project with community health centers and we developed a toolkit for them to use. I think for them, they're really looking at emergencies in three ways. One, doctors and health centers have to protect the organization because without the organization, they won't be able to deliver health care. Mm -hmm. Then they need to do some training for their clinical and non-clinical staff because they have to be prepared or they won't be able to come to work. Right. Then, of course, and this is not least in importance, it's the most, working with their patients who could be potentially vulnerable mm -hmm. to train them about what they can do to protect themselves and also what they can realistically expect from their health center during emergencies. Mm -hmm. There are uh, also, um, there are some registries they talk about in different communities uh, for people with disabilities that they can register. Well, mm -hmm. How important is that for people to do that? So um, some cities and towns have registries which are databases that could be paper or on the computer mm -hmm. with information about people with disabilities. They're voluntary. Our state also has the indicator form which is accepted in um, every city and town and that has very abbreviated information. I would say that Registries are controversial in the sense that mm -hmm. some people think they're very important, some people don't think they're important, and some people, and, and this is where I fall, are in the middle. If a city or town has one and keeps it updated, that to me is one data point of information that's useful in planning, but it's not the only data point. And mm -hmm. I think a city or town makes a mistake if they think that their registry or their indicator form has all the information they're going to need about people with disabilities in their town. I think it's wiser to work with your community partners, the disability organizations in town, learn about the needs in aggregate of the people they serve, mm -hmm. and use those disability organizations to um, communicate with their clientele so that they can learn how to prepare themselves in emergencies and they can learn what their city or town will do for them. Okay. Uh, is Delon, are there any ex uh, expectation from people with disabilities that in case of an emergency that the town is going to be coming and rescuing them? Um, so, I mean, there is some somewhat of an expectation, um, but what is, again, what is really important to understand and to know is, is that what's going to happen. So it's really planning and understanding how that plan affects you. You mm -hmm. know, make sure that you're included in that plan. That's why we strongly encourage, you know, f uh, residents meeting with, our, uh, with their first responders so they can actually know what's going to happen mm -hmm. instead of assuming. You know, what we, wa what we don't want to have um, is people being left behind mm -hmm. and assuming that there's going to be someone who's going to come there and rescue them. Right. So that's why we do encourage some of these registries. And for for example, the the 911 Disability Indicator Program is, is an amazing program. It's a voluntary program, but what mm -hmm. it does allow you to identify certain disabilities. So the next time you call 911, any of that information on the uh, any other information on the program, it will pop up on a dispatcher screen. Yeah. So now the dispatchers can understand how they can better help you and serve you before they even come to your location. But it allows them to know what's going on, how they can better help you. Exactly. Yeah. I think he makes a, a really good point, and I would add that becoming a CERT or MRC member, volunteering with your community, if your community has a disability commission that's going to help work on the emergency plan, be involved in that. Some communities have um, volunteer emergency planning committees I think, and I'm hoping you would agree, it's yes. all about the relationships. All about the relationship and building That's that right. relationship, yeah. both residents yeah. and the first responders Absolutely. working in those communities. Yeah, and in the Medical Reserve Corps, and there's quite a few of them across the country, mm -hmm. do try to educate the public on ways of being prepared. It's just that most people need to take advantage of it. 
So uh, we're kind of running short. So what? Are, any last comments either one of you want to have about people be being prepared, particularly prepared to uh, shelter in place? Because I think that's important because a lot of towns aren't prepared to put people in shelters. You know, some of them only have temporary shelters, so they have to be able to be prepared to spend at least two, three days on their own. So what would you recommend? Yes, I would say build your kit. Have water, food, and some of the basic and essential supplies. Have a radio. You know, if power goes out, mm. you still want to have communications. Know what's going on. Mm. Know if there's going to be help. Have a flashlight. Uh, there's a device which is a four-in-one flashlight that will provide you with a radio, mm -hmm. an alert siren, can charge most cell phone, and obviously provide uh, light for you. But that'll be that's a great tool to have because mm. it all goes on a cranking system. Yep. Right. But you really want to make sure that you have the basics. You have the food, the water. You know, if you're someone who, who may get cold, mm -hmm. you know, have uh, some hand warmers or have a blanket. Mm -hmm. Or if it's super hot, you know, make sure you have enough water for hydration. Right, exactly. And Susan? I would add that it's really tough to make a plan at the last minute when the storm has arrived. Right. So as much in advance as, as possible, um, people with disabilities and parents of children with disabilities should do that planning and really think through their own individual needs. So, of course, I agree with everything mm -hmm. Daylon said, but for example, I know a family with a child with autism and part of their plan includes um, battery operated video games so that if their power goes out mm -hmm. and that's their child's favorite occupation, right they've planned for that contingency. That's good. Well, there's a lot of interesting uh, information and a lot of important information. And hopefully, I'd like you two to come back next month and talk to us further. I'd like to discuss more about sheltering and what we need to know about that as well. OK? So uh, my name is Sandra Valtero, and this is Be Prepared. And we will, we will be back next month to continue our talk on how to be prepared in emergencies for people with disabilities. So thank you so much for joining us, and uh, thank you, and have a good evening.